I'm Ben Allen. Uh, my wife Judy was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in July of 2009. We've been married 33 years. Um, after her diagnosis, um, the first two years, uh, her symptoms were relatively mild um, and we had a, a pretty normal relationship in, in terms of physical intimacy. Um, at about the two year mark, um, her symptoms began to progress more, um, and, and my observation was that she was highly frustrated, um, and that led to some distance, um, some lack of interest on her part in, in terms of intimacy, and she developed a, a paranoia um, that she believed that there were other women living in our house. She believed that our bedroom wasn't private, that people could see in through the closet. And so she was just completely um, uncomfortable with being intimate um, in our bedroom. And we talked with her counselor about that and her counselor suggested, well, how about using another room. And that worked for a while, um, but there was a point where uh, that, that didn't work either. And I can recall very clearly one time we went into the other room and we're in bed together and, and she said, there are too many people here and somebody needs to leave. And I guess that's me. And she got up and walked out. So for, I forget how long, a few months perhaps, uh, we had no, no intimacy, no, from my perspective, no interest on her part. And I had learned over years that without her interest and often without her initiation, um, our intimacy just didn't work. Um, and so I, I waited and um, was sensitive to if there was going to be a right time. And even in the midst of that time of paranoia, there was one day where early in the morning, she said, I want to go to bed with you. And we went in the other room and we had an absolutely wonderful time. And that was the last time. And that was about four years ago. In the last three years, there are, uh, there have been several times where we have had intimacy in a different way. And I guess that's where I have come uh, to accept the reality of, of where we are now. There have been many times where she just surprises me with, with intimate, um, loving, affectionate expressions. Um, sometimes we'll be walking around her community and, and most of the time she doesn't speak much. Often if she does, it's not understandable. But every once in a while something will come out just perfectly clearly. So one day we were walking and I could tell she was not having a good day. She was really down, she was really disconnected. But she let me take her hand and so we're walking hand in hand down the hallway. She stops and turns to me and said perfectly clearly, I love you. And so those are the times that I hold on to. Uh, we're very grateful uh, that Dr. Merdad Ayadi from Stanford has agreed to come walk us through this difficult and important topic. Dr. Ayadi uh, did his medical training at Iran University of Medical Sciences, his residency at UC Davis, he did a fellowship at Stanford, he's board certified in geriatric and family medicine, and he's the author of Paths to Healthy Aging. Dr. Ayadi.
Thank you so much, Josh, and good morning, everyone, from Northern California to lovely people of Southern California. I'm so glad and honored to be here. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about one of the most controversial topic. It's not only about dementia, it's even for elderly people. When the people are getting aging, this is one of the most neglected topic, I believe, in, even in geriatric care and geriatric medicine. Um, and I think we have a problem on the first step because sexuality and intimacy in aging population has already been neglected. Now think about if people get dementia, then we have a lot of problems to just explaining it or just having bringing um, this discussion on the table. Now, Today, um, I'm going to have a lot of slides, but I'm going to passing through the slides. The reason I put in all these slides because it's for, for educational purpose. If you have access online later, you can go and look at it. But I'm going to talking through the slides quickly uh, to make it on the time. There's a different topics that we're going to talk. First, talking about sexuality, and then one topic that we're also going to talk about. It's one of the most important topic that we are as a geriatrician, and even our colleague in psychiatry also involved which is a sexually inappropriate behavior that happens with dementia. And actually comes to a lot of the issues with the policy and procedures, especially in the long-term places. Uh, again, some disclosure at the beginning uh, and, and the places that I work, and i just doing the consult for them as well. Uh, before we actually discuss, there is one thing that I wanted to say. If you wanted to listen to this topic, or even in the future, because my job is technically today, I like that at the end of this discussion, we just get a one message that dementia people is still, they are a sexually being people. And if you get this message and you can, again, get this message to other people, then I think I've done my job. And there are some of the things in agreement is we have, if we know that sexuality is a basic human needs, and again, when we talk about appropriate sexual disease, a behavior, and we mark the people as disease. And that happens a lot of time in dementia people. They have absolutely inappropriate sexual behavior, especially in long-term places, dementia units. And we just say, well, that's absolutely inappropriate. And again, it's uh, that's a topic we said that the sexuality in later life is absolutely being neglected. If you guys have uh, agree with these topics or these three things that I talk, you don't need to listen to the rest of my talk. You can go and come back for the next topic. But, um, but if you have some controversial here and have some question, just listen and we can have some discussion about it uh, later. Now, there are some of the question, is the people with dementia, they can have sex? Are they capable to making decision about having sex? And what are the current policies in the long-term places, which I'm going to talk about it, and have we trained people about it? Now, when we talk about it, sex and intimacy, it's a really, really private subject. It's not as easy to discuss. I'm going to say, as a physician, majority of us as a healthcare provider, we think that sex is not appropriate and don't for, for people that have cognitive impairment. It only should happen for people that don't have any cognitive problems. Now, think about we are as a provider, we haven't been trained. I can tell you in entire my medical school fellowship, residency, we never even been trained for like five minutes to 10 minutes about that. And that's, that's a way when I come to the practice and I wanted to discuss about a case that they come to me and they talk about sexuality, even in elderly or even demented patients, I don't have enough training. Now, and I have a, every year we have a lot of trainees, students, residents, fellows gonna be graduated every year. Now, that's definitely a lack of training. Think about physician, when we go to the next level, nurses, caregiver, our long-term facility administrated, we still don't have. And I want to tell you that sometimes I get disappointed about that. Many times we had this offer for a big, big organization, American Geriatric Society and all the other places, to have this discussion more as far as like education and training. Some, sometimes we've been successful. I should be appreciated from, again, this organization that actually have this topic for discussion because a lot of time the people don't pay attention to it. And we see the frustration in the people, we see the frustration in the caregiver and the many of the uh, other uh, 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 person. Now, again, and it's so hard. Like for example, me, I'm coming from a third world country originally. Now, I'm thinking about one day if, my, if I wanna have this discussion with my own father and mom, that's gonna be difficult for me to even bring it up. 
And now think about the children having their parents or loved one having the, I mean, the somebody of their partner is actually gonna be demented. And now they're gonna have this discussion about intimacy and sexuality. A lot of time that happens that the family members bring the demented parents to the facility and they see that they're like their mom or dad has a relationship with a new person and they can't accept that, they cannot. They get so mad and say, well, who's this guy in, this, in my mom's bedroom? And there have been many times that that's been become a complaint, even lawsuit about that against the facility, the why this gentleman was in my, that, that gentleman also is a demented person as well. And that's, that's, that's gonna come to more of this. Now, this is the WHO about sexuality, which is a right human being. I don't wanna go on detail on that. But we have a three different things about sexuality. We're talking about intimacy which is not necessary as a sexuality, is a feeling of love um, or, again, satisfaction when there is a partner presence or when thinking about that. Now, intimacy is a very, very important thing. It can, this is something that we ignore, and this is important, because not intimacy, it's, again, correlated exactly to sexual intercourse. We have sensuality, which is touching the body and, and again, and having some pleasure uh, related to that. That can even, a lot of time we, we have a discussion about sensuality, can be a massage, can be like a, some people go to like a hot tub and all this stuff and they get satisfaction about that. But when we talk about sexuality, we're talking about the broad topic. We're talking about intimacy, sensuality, and also orgasm and sexual intercourse. But not necessary when we talk about sexuality, the first thing we talk, it's about, oh, this sexual intercourse should happen for satisfaction. That's not, that's not the case. The biggest problem I believe we had, and we're actually missing in modern life, is touch. We're actually losing it big time. And this has happened, this is one of the first things that when the kid's gonna born in the first seconds, we always do the touch. The, the grasping and touch is the first reflex that all the babies have. And very interesting that because even we are, as a doctors, when we're practicing medicine, I think that one of the biggest human things that actually we lost is the touch of the physicians to the patient. We forget that. Majority of us as a physician, we just see the patients as one of my colleagues, Dr. Abraham Wergis in Stanford says, patients become an icon in the computer. We see the patients at the lab results in the monitor and we forget the touching them. The touching is getting almost forgettable in, in, or in our modern life. And the other things, it's media. The discussion about media when we talk about a sex is only talking about the beautiful young people, they have, they have sex. Nobody pay attention and it's true, it's almost a joke that we're talking about sexuality in aging population. But let's, let's just wanted to tell you, aging population, especially baby boomers, are very different with our ancestor because they have, they have access to the online, they can do online dating, they have a lot of things, we have lots of website, match.com, a lot of other things that you probably know, but it's a, we're actually facing a very different aging population. We're also having a, some of the new definition of the sexuality that we're never able to open discussion about it. We have LGBT uh, population, especially we living in California. Northern California is uh, as, as, as one of the biggest, again, area for LGBT uh, population, lesbian, um, gay, and transsexual. And when now this generation's actually getting dementia and cognitive impairment, we have a, we have a difficult time to even placing them because there's no definition for, for them, and there's no policy for them, for what is their preference as far as the sexuality. These are the new things that we need to discuss about it. Now, we know it's actually, um, a lot of reports says that actually even people, when they enroll in Medicare, they're still sexually active. And we have a lot of other reports, and that, that sexually active is not necessarily against sexual intercourse, but as far as intimacy and, and sensuality, we have to respect that. But the problem is dementia. When the dementia happened, it actually is, I mean, as we, this, I mean, we saw in the video, it definitely impacts all aspects of life. Dementia, the first thing it happened when you see on a video is identity change, which is a partner is no longer to identify that person. Now the other problem is happened when the people have more advanced dementia, they go to facility and they misidentify another person in the facility as their partner or their loved one. 
and they're trying to be close to that person. And that becomes, by mistake, interpreted, oh, this is inappropriate sexual behavior, which is not. It's not. And again, the other thing is happened that there's a new definition of, of relationship. Why is that? Think about a husband and wife, and not this case, and a wife get dementia. And now husband, so far, they've been husband and wife, and now they become caregiver. Now they have to do cleaning, do the basic things on the LDL. And the other thing is attraction of sexuality is going to be lost. A lot of time, as I hear from the partner said, you know what, I have no attraction to my partner anymore. I mean, I have to do cleaning. I just have to take him or her to the toilet every day. And I don't have this feeling that we can, we can attach to each other again. And that's hard. This is very heartbreaking. What is important is, especially you guys, as, as, as having more discussion, reassurance, and just telling them, you know, it, it's, it doesn't mean that the people with dementia should not, should not be sexually active or at least have intimacy as well. And I know a lot of the things has happened, identity change or, or again, um, change on the relationship. And, the, these, these are the hardest thing for a lot of caregivers, as you see that the guy was so frustrated on the video as well and, and became very emotional. I mean, he really likes to have this relationship to happen, but when you see that this, the lady has misidentified the husband and sees a lot of it because it will have some paranoia as well at the same time. And that that's becomes a, a big challenge at that. There's a lot of things that, uh, again, uh, Perception of what means appropriate behavior, or what does it mean with appropriate behavior, this is going to be a lot of things that depends on the three controversial. One of the things is personal value. Physician, caregiver, partner, or anybody. Um, that's going to go to the cultural. Many of the facilities, uh, we have the caregiver, wonderful caregiver, as they hire as a CNA or a caregiver, but they come from the different culture, religious background. And talking about sexuality and intimacy based on what they have, it's going to be hard. That's why in my first slide, I, I, I try to say, if you really want to think about this topic, you need to, whatever you have a belief, religion, anything, put it on the door outside, and then come and talk about it, because you cannot. If you come with your own personal value, there's no a way that you can do that. Now, Again, the partner of uh, no longer being to able to necessary care, um, th these are the things that they're feeling guilty when it comes to the partner. The other things that are controversial is about um, older residents, uh, they, they think about sex, still think about sex and sexuality that we discuss. Um, and again, one of the other things is it's happened is even if they have wanted to have sex or intimacy, the other problem is in many of the long-term facility, there is no place to do it. Um, there is no privacy. There is not any designated place to do it. And this has becomes one of the biggest issue. A lot of the normal sexual behavior, I've seen a lot of time they have a male demented patient is starting to have masturbating in hallway. And they label that as inappropriate sexual behavior and then asking for some psychotropic medication to be given to that person. But this is not necessarily inappropriate. And I would just want to say, tell you that this is the, the sexual expression that we identify as an inappropriate. Um, and again, they have a sexual, totally normal sexual behavior, but in the, in, in the wrong place. And again, sometimes they can confuse between this is a public place or this is a private place. And again, these are the stranger, these are exposed that as we discuss. The other things that is important, which I'm gonna go so quickly on that, I'm not gonna go because that's more legal thing, is talking about capacity and, and competency, which is, uh, again, if they're able to make a decision, if they're going to be in a sexual uh, relationship. That comes to more fundamental rights for the long-term facility because they wanted to protect everyone. If there's something happened, especially in appropriate sexual or even sexual, appropriate sexual behavior, a lot of the long-term po uh, places, they wanted to have some policy in, and, and again, make sure that all the people, they are, um, um, again, protected on that. I don't know if you hear about this news that one of the, um, Henry Rehan was in the news like years ago because he actually he wasn't uh, found guilty about sexual. But I wanted to have a two to three minutes. Listen to this slide. This is a part of the NPR because this is something that I want to give you as a message uh, can be helpful. Let's listen to that. A case in Iowa has put a spotlight on the issue of sexual relationships in nursing homes. 
Today, a jury acquitted former state lawmaker Henry Rahans of sexually abusing his wife last May. He was accused of having sex with her after nursing home staff told him she was no longer capable of consenting. She had Alzheimer's disease and died in August. Sex in long-term care facilities isn't uncommon, but as NPR's Ina Jaffe reports, the long-term care industry is still grappling with the issue. The fact that some people with dementia still have sex lives isn't news at the Hebrew home in Riverdale, New York. They've had a written policy to help staff manage such relationships for 20 years. It was controversial in 1995 and it's controversial today. Daniel Reingold is the CEO of River Spring Health, the nonprofit that runs the Hebrew home. We um, knew that there was intimacy occurring and we considered it to be a civil right and a legal right. And we also felt that intimacy was a good thing, that touch is one of the last pleasures we abandon and lose as we age. Brian Gold says the policy also protects residents from unwanted sexual contact, and he argues that people with dementia are indeed capable of giving consent. People who have Alzheimer's disease or dementia are asked on a daily basis to make decisions about their desires, from what they eat to activities that they may want to engage in. Including intimacy with another person. But even with a written policy, it's not that easy for nursing homes to figure out when consent to sex is really valid, says Evelyn Tenenbaum, a professor of law at Albany Law School and bioethics at Albany Medical College. For example, suppose you have a couple and the the woman believes that the man that she's seeing is her husband and then she consents to a sexual relationship. Is that really consent if she doesn't understand who he is and that she's not married to him. Sometimes in such cases, nursing homes will defer to the wishes of the resident's family, says Tenenbaum. On the other hand, nursing homes are required to take care of the psychosocial needs of their residents. And whether psychosocial needs would include sexual relationships is a question. A question with no commonly accepted answer. The American Healthcare Association, a trade group representing the majority of nursing homes, only suggests its member facilities develop their own policies. Patricia Bach, a geriatric psychologist, says when she started looking into the topic, she didn't find much. There was very, very little empirical evidence, little data, few research studies, and it really was a lower priority issue for long-term care providers. So, with a colleague, she surveyed members of the American Medical Directors Association, which represents physicians who work in long-term care facilities. Only 25 to 30 percent actually had formal training in the area of intimacy and sexuality, as it would pertain to older adults. 30 percent had no training at all. And only about 30 percent of nursing homes had formal policies, something which needs to change and fast, says Daniel Reingold of Okay, now, how many of you guys in audience working in a long-term facility in memory care at either a job of RC if you're administrative or social worker in this group? If, I just want to ask you a question. If you, have you had any policy or procedure in your facility about sexual intimacy and dementia patient? Um, in many places that I've went through that and I've been dark places, I couldn't find a single policy actually that being there for the people. Now, I don't want to go to the test of capacity. There are a lot of things that is standard, but I just want to say there's no, no universal actually test that we can do about sexuality and intimacy. There are some of the things which is, comes with the light and assessment, which is, again, based on the knowledge, uh, rationality, and again, if there are going to be some uh, voluntariness as well. But again, uh, you can find some of this uh, discussion and both American, uh, again, IBA and also um, American uh, uh, psychiatry as well, they have some of the um, um, things that they can um, I'm going to go through past, but I just technically they're just saying that what does it mean with consenting if somebody being in a sexual, if, if they're able to protect themselves, if they're understanding the situation and all this stuff. But you can find some of this in the Hebrew home uh, um, organization, some of the policy. But it's so important to understand that uh, 
that if you don't have any policy and procedure related that, it is important to have this discussion. I'm gonna go through that, which is some of the conclusion from American Medical Directorship, that for every single person who's gonna be admitted in any dementia unit or long-term facility, that discussion needs to come on the first day with family members, with a partner, that if this has happened, what is gonna be your preference? Even when they have the mild cognitive impairment and mild dementia, what's gonna be the um, actually uh, their preference if they have this issue. Now, quickly, definitely we need to have some change as far as the sexual advance directive. Again, when you have um, more not in the cognitive impairment situation, what is your sexual preference going to be? Now, quickly in my last 10 minutes, I wanted to discuss about inappropriate sexual behavior and then go through the question. The best one is like 85 years old, we're talking about a moderately severe Alzheimer's disease in a nursing home started to approaching to a uh, female uh, staff and with uh, which is um, kind of like upsetting the family uh, again and then going to the different floor is starting to have a lot of inappropriate sexual behavior this is one of the most important topic just before I came here like two weeks ago one of my own patient has been kicked out from the facility because he's trying to reach into the female staff again, touching uh, uh, their body, and they said, oh, okay, we can't tolerate that. Let's just evacuate from the facility. And this guy has been ping pong between places, and that's, and it's very sad things about it that I've seen many of these people happen as, as, as a, every day as a practice, that they are been, they've been diagnosed with inappropriate sexual behavior, but there's no way that they can stay in the places. Again, they can be very complex. It's a lot of the legal things going on. We know the reasons a lot of time is because the, the effects of the frontal and temporal lobe, it happens, and that's why they're gonna have this um, um, situation. A lot of time happened that we know a lot of people, they wanted to take off their clothes. Um, we know in the children, like for example, an infant or toddler, they don't like to put the clothes on because they still don't have their temporal and frontal lobe has been developed. And that's why I know that like, um, I remember for my own child, he every time when we wanted to put him the clothes on, he started to cry and run away. And we know that that happens when we have this part of the brains get affected as well. Now, a lot of the social things can happen, again, the, uh, for, for, for lack of intimacy, there's no privacy as well. But a lot of time it happens because they have delirium. Maybe there is a, some, some infections going on and that needs to be ruled out and this is the part of our job. A lot of medication that we're putting on that people, they actually causing this problem as well, and, 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 and that becomes a, a hypersexual behavior. Um, uh, a lot of things is, again, uh, the problem is a caregiver feeling very guilt about it, uh, they feel shame, they don't want to report that as well, and, and, and that's kind of like a challenge that we have in many of our facilities if you have any, any persons with inappropriate sexual behavior. And there are some of the things that we can report that, that you can find it on the website. I'm gonna go through that quickly and I'm happy to answer your question. But they have some of the things that you, you need to do of assessment, that what is exactly happened at the time when someone has inappropriate, before you saying, okay, we're gonna call the doctors to give a medication or we're gonna evacuate that person from the facility. And when you have this, I really like the previous uh, uh, conversation about elderly abuse, that we should have a discussion with that person in the private with respect, not in the front of all the people and putting that person on the chair and talking about the sexual behavioral that happened. After we have evaluation, this is not a delirium process, this is not um, 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 other things, then we look for, for kind of like treatment that we need to do as um, um, as far as, again, the nursing assessment is so important. We need the interdisciplinary team to discuss about it. Look for motiv motivation. A lot of time, the people actually have feeling warm and they actually wanted to take off their clothes. And one of the suggestions a lot of people have that maybe we have, we've put them on the clothes that they're able to not open it from the front. But again, or maybe we need to use a better clothing as far as, because they just have the warmness and they wanted to take off their clothes and that can happen. The management is always going to be um, number one non-pharmacological. Unfortunately, we really don't have any trial or randomized at least clinical trial to see what's the difference between that. But in none of the non-pharmacological, we definitely need to remove the, again, aggravating factor. If there is a two persons, we probably try to separate them from them. And there are some of the things that um, 
it's, it's kind of innovating. We try to make them to be uh, uh, kind of like busy with their hands. If there are, uh, and again, I'm not necessarily saying that, for example, a lot of the male, elderly, male dementia person, they may have the master doing the masturbation, but, and that's okay, because I was just talking to one of the researchers from Netherlands. They said we have the device actually in one of our long-term facility that they automatically do the masturbation for them. And we actually had a very successful outcome of using less psychotropic medication on these people, but makes them less agitated. And again, I'm just saying that a lot of things, they can easily be distracted. We can, we can use it. Um, in Australia, they d definitely have some specialized geriatric service that they're using for this situation. I just wanted to, in my five minutes, just talking about um, some of the creative work that people have done. In Emory, they're using the stuffed animal and just giving to that person that they have the situation. And it actually seems that it helped. I mean, the person finding the stuffed animal and pink panther, they actually use one of the pink panther things. And there was a study has been done in 2005, and the person had this problem of touching, grabbing genital uh, of the female residents and the staff, and they starting to give him the staff animal. And, and it was uh, three foot uh, tall. And usually putting on the, on the bed, he's trying to fold him, and technically they are able to taper down many of the psychotic medication on that. Um, last couple minutes, there are some of the options for pharmacologic available. Um, this is the last resource. Again, I'm just saying that we try to do everything non-pharmacological, but if we have to, there are some of the pharmacological options available in a very aggressive sexual behavior. Somebody have front to temporal dementia and they're not able to control, and we use any of them. I just want to quickly say, because we know antipsychotic, antidepressant, we use it because side effect of antidepressant is actually going to be sexual dysfunction. And that's something that we say, okay, we can use them. And there are some of the medication you can use. But the one thing that I want to say, because we use hormonal agents in the male people, they have inappropriate sexual behavior, which is using progesterone or using medication for big uh, uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia like finasteride. These are, these are helpful, but these are also legally very controversial because it's technically you do the, um, again, chemical castration for these people. What we use, some people use, I mean, the hormonal thing like estrogen, um, and there are some of the evidence showing that uh, they may be helpful, but again, very limited the study. We maybe used, um, um, uh, again, gonadotropin releasing hormone agents for these people. Antipsychotic is still can be last resource, either Haldol or any anti-convulsive um, medication. Neurontin or gabapentin, very, very uh, small trial has been shown that is effective. Cholinesterase inhibitor, especially rivastigmine, in very, very limited study shows that it's helpful. But again, if you ask me about it, there's not any uh, basically a good study about any of them. Uh, antihistamine uh, type 2 receptors also can be helpful. Antifungal medication, there's some people using it, but they have all side effects and issues. Major ethical issues is a conflict of the individual autonomy and the right of sexual expression. Um, and again, it's, it's very, very important to have this understanding. And again, the US Bill of Rights is a federal regulation mandate that institutional care as be less restrictive as possible. And the other things is a liability. And for a lot of healthcare providers, which they're, they're scared about that, and they're choosing the pharmacologic agents in, in the people they have hypersexuality. How do the caregiver implant intervention in at least restrictive means possible while ensuring everybody's safety? And again, definitely we should have a clear policies related to if we have somebody with such a behavior. And detailed assessment, effective intervention, uh, good documentation, which I'm always says, um, again, hormonal agent, which we use it, it's very, very important because, again, it can be subject of chemical castration and we should be very help, very careful about it. Also, they can have a side effect of uh, blood clots as well, and we, we definitely do not recommend to using it. Um, the major things, it's a real complex. It's something that we should always start to non-farm. And again, in the last one minute or job is definitely a systemic policy for that. Training, training, training. This is something that we are big missing in our in our institute, in in our in our training for 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 even our residents, fellows, students, nurses as well. Um, and again, um, having the staff 
can plan the individual's intervention. But the other thing is so important that we discuss with people about, uh, about the sexuality. That can happen in the dementia unit, especially with family members and discussion about it at the beginning. I can't tell you how many cases as yearly basis, I'm sure uh, other experts also can have some stories that we see um, that it comes as a controversial in the long-term places and also dementia units. And again, the, the biggest issue is lack of policy for, um, for this uh, population. Again, it's very controversial, it's very sensitive uh, topic. Uh, the message that I wanted to tell you before we starting the question is, Dementia people, they are still sexually being people. And as if you can't get this message and give it to other people, that's going to be starting off this conversation all over the place. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Questions? Not sensitive questions, please. Uh, most of your speech spoke about the um, assisted living environment. We provide care one-on-one -on -one in the home. And um, <clears throat> probably about 10 years ago, we ran into a situation where um, we had a lady with dementia we were caring for, and her husband was um, not ill. He was um, normal, but kind of an alpha male, not as empathic as the one that you showed in your um, initial clip. And um, it became a real problem for the caregivers that they had to stand by. And it seemed as though, from their perspective, that he was on the verge of you know, committing rape because she really wasn't um, enjoying it. In fact, you know, they would afterwards have to clean up. And it was just a mess. Oh, and I'm, my question to you is this. Um, in a situation like that, Sexual surrogacy be an option. I didn't see that as, a, but you know, he need, he has his needs, but she can't meet them. That's true. He loves her, doesn't want to be, you know, a player. But he, so that's my question. That's a very very important question. Uh, the most important thing on evaluation of uh, any sexual relationship between two partners, when one partner has dementia, is exactly we're talking about evaluation of a capacity. Uh, one thing is important that intimacy or sexuality should be enjoyable for both parts. And this is, this is the time that they ask us for intervention on that. And then if we have this report that one part, which is major time, is that demented person. It's, and again, I have the other, other side as well because, it's, again, non-demented uh, partner also may have the same feeling that they're not enjoying it. That intimacy and sexuality should be stopped. This should be stopped because it caused more agitation, more, more problem for that person. This is exactly the importance of talking about training of the caregiver to report that. Uh, many times we see when the partner goes to the bedroom or they have two demented uh, person that they misidentify themselves as like the partner and they go to the room and they have a fun time with each other. They sleep together in the room and they're both happy about this relationship. And then we separate them, and one of them start to become agitated. And, and again, a lot of the neuropsychiatry um, symptoms are gonna happen. Then we know intimacy and sexuality was beneficial for both of them. Uh, it's very good, important, I mean, it's a very important question. I think evaluation of each individual, and that comes to the caregiver assessment. This is exactly what we're talking. Caregiver needs to report that that person, especially demented person, is not a case of, again, uh, being unhappy about the situation. And if, they are, if the person is happy, that's fine. Just we encourage them, actually, to do that as intimacy and sexuality. But a very, very important question that we, we need to address that. <clears throat> good, great, good, wonderful question. Um, uh, Yes, here, this place is. Uh, uh, again, this is true, because there is no place for training. Um, Alzheimer Association overall trying to kind of doing this training more. Um, again, as I told you, we have, uh, uh, we have a hard time to finding the places to just bring it up this topic as general topic. Um, 
about it. When I, I remember when I, was, uh, when I wrote my first book, Paths to Healthy Aging, one of the things that I got a lot of comments nationally that you talk about nutrition, you talk about polypharm, which is over medication, you talk about exercise, but you forgot to talk about the sex. And, and, and it's true. And I purposely, I actually didn't talk about it because I really wanted to write one thing about this topic. Again, the, the problem is the first step we already neglecting this topic for aging population. Then we, when it comes to dementia, it's hard. Now, how we can go more training, I think you guys need to ask more from your organizations, anything, to have this topic to just be discussed about it. I think it's kind of like more question and answer topic, and you guys have some people to come and just, just discuss about it. If we have this topic more, then we have a better training for staff and caregiver, and I'm sure the institutes and fast facilities, they're gonna have a more training for their staff as well. But you're absolutely right. Where I think is the first place is still Alzheimer's Association, it's uh, gonna be the best place to starting to have this discussion for dementia people. I think some hands I, I'm hardly able to see here, but. Hi. Um, I have a question that you said, you know, if uh, the person with dementia misidentifies another person with dementia yes. as their spouse and they're enjoying the sexual activity, then it should be allowed. And other authors that I have read or individuals, ethicists who speak about this topic would, would say, how do you weigh the risk because of um, fluctuations in the person person's ability to recognize right. that that person goes to bed with someone they, they misidentified as their spouse, but then they wake up in the middle of the night and they go, what am I doing in bed with this person? He's a stranger or he's not my spouse. How, I mean, how would you answer that ethical challenge? There is no way to answer. That's why I'm saying that definitely that comes to uh, this one of the things that we talk about it advance, uh, again, directive before the person actually getting, and this is one of the things that I think it is important. We talk about a lot of advanced directive, re re again, related to the end of life and all this stuff, but I think is sexuality also important to discuss about it before the people actually getting through that. Um, the other things is no one can have answer for you. There's no any uh, guideline that or, or ethically, if you ask for legal experts and lawyers, also they're not gonna have an answer. They're gonna say exactly, is, is this is the right relationship? Is it the case of the rape? Is this gonna be the, I mean, capacity that person to make a decision? That's why there's, that, that's why I'm telling you, personal value, belief, and all this stuff, they're all actually intervened with your evaluation. If you feeling, and if everybody in agreement that these two demented people, even they don't recognize each other, they have a good time, then, again, if you ask my opinion, as my, this is gonna be my own, uh, again, uh, value and opinion, that let them be happy. Now, it's true, they may be sometime happen, they're gonna be misidentified, again, it just makes it more agitation. This is exactly back to the question of this gentleman asked. This is the time we have to evaluate again and separate them from each other, because that means that there's gonna start to have a distress. But there's no any written guideline. That's why we're so behind of having the good guideline re related to any of this question. There's a law in this state that makes it very difficult for a couple uh, to maintain their intimacy when they both need care in a facility. Yes. Uh, my in-laws, uh, she had dementia, and he was very frail with Parkinson's, and we were trying to find a facility for them, but they weren't allowed to be in the same room because she had to be in a uh, dementia unit, and he wasn't allowed to be there, right. and she wasn't allowed to be in the other room. So ran into that many times, very difficult. That's true, it's very difficult, especially in the United States. Um, in many other countries, they're starting to solving this problem. Um, some of the other countries, Australia, I know a lot of the European countries are starting to solving this problem. Definitely, if somebody, one has dementia, one, one not, and is like living in assistant living or independent living facility, they're kind of like making the time that be together. Um, again, one of the biggest problem we have in a facility, have you ever seen in a facility here, as your observation, do they have any private area that the couples can stay together? No. 
They don't. Um, and, and that should change. The other things that I haven't discussed about it is importance of sexuality and intimacy in a hospice patient. That's actually one of the big, I mean, one of the very interesting topic that this, uh, this stays a lot of people talking about it, that if there's one of the partner, I mean, one of her partner is dying, how much is actually gonna be helpful that they actually stay together in the same bed, in the same bed, uh, in the same place, in the same, same bed at the last days of the life? And there are some of the researchers actually doing about it. This thing needs to be changed. Uh, we encourage, that's why again, the job is training and education to, to the people or the facilities or long-term facilities to make this happen for this aging population. If we're gonna go this way, we're gonna have a triple dementia people in the next years, the number is gonna be higher, or facility is gonna be less, we will have a lot of problem in the future. We, sh we should have, especially with, with this, current baby boomers that are aging and they're very different with the previous people. We need to make the change today. And again, today is also late, but we need to do it. Thank you, Thank you so much, I appreciate it.